I'm very glad to be able to give this talk because the last 10 years have been particularly exciting, extraordinary really, for students of Greek religion. There have been two major epigraphic discoveries. I'm going to start with the one that I've got in the habit of calling the bombshell from Marmorini. When I first read this new text, I felt a mixture of elation and depression. Elation because it was so novel, so exciting. Depression too, because it was so novel. I spent all my career studying Greek religion and I wondered how it possibly could be the case that a new document could find me so completely unprepared to cope with it. It was a real shock. So the bombshell from Marmorini is an enormous stele inscribed on both sides that was found in a ditch near the village of Marmorini in northeast Thessaly. That's so. Um, uh, it would be about somewhere up here. Um, the nearest town is Larissa, um, and we're in inland Thessaly, as you can see, there are mountains between us, uh, the Great Thessalian Plain, and the sea. So, um, this is inland. The working presumption as to why this huge stele turned up in a ditch is that it had been found by clandestine diggers and then because it was so impracticable to, translate, to, to, to transport and market, then just thrown away. Um, no proof of that, but that's the guess. Um, so here it is. I'm sorry that the, uh, the pictures are uh, done in different uh, contexts. Um, so a remarkably big stele. Um, one side, the side on the left of the screen, um, is in excellent state and can be read from top to bottom. It doesn't, the writing doesn't quite get to the bottom. Uh, the other one is in much worse state. As you can see that um, uh, the, it's not so bad in the middle, but top and bottom, it's uh, very much uh, eroded. Um, again, that's uh, a close up of the top of that side. Uh, there were letters in that space at the top, but they've more or less departed from us. It's controversial which of these two sides is actually uh, side one. Um, the original French editors changed their minds about this, and I think the matter's still uncertain, so I'm just going to call them respectively the messy side and the good side. This bombshell first struck, first was published in 2015. Um, along with my colleague, Scott Scullion, I published a long article about it, actually the longest article I've ever written um, the year after. Well, there was a saying, fools rush in. Um, and subsequently, some readings on the messy side were improved, uh, a lot of high tech was brought in multi-spectral imaging and that improved things a certain amount. So some of the things that we said in our article then are now seen to be wrong. Um, the place to look for this text now is a place which is actually very well worth knowing about for other reasons. It's a website called Collection of Greek Ritual Norms. Um, if you just Google C-G-R-N, um, it's about the second hit you'll get. So it's easy to find C-G-R-N. And in it, um, this text is number 225. And you'll find there the Greek text, um, an English translation, a French translation as well, because it's a, it's a binational project and also a very detailed commentary and all the up-to-date bibliography and so on. Well, the main dating criterion for this text is, in fact, the only dating criterion is letter forms. And 
on the basis of letter forms, we put the text in the late third or possibly the first part of the second century BCE. What it is, is uh, a series of regulations for the sanctuary of a goddess whose name is never mentioned. She's just called the goddess. There are several gods and other goddesses mentioned who must have had subsidiary altars and they are named, but the owner of the sanctuary is always just the goddess. Whether that's because there was some taboo about naming her or whether it's just because perfectly self-evident to anyone who went there who this goddess was is not clear at the moment. Well, it emerges from the text that the goddess presided over quite an elaborate sanctuary. There are references in the text to a temple, Naos, of course it needn't have been very big, a, a gateway, a propylon, an elegant gateway, a, a peristyle, so a colonnade, um, a great altar, several other altars as well. Well, how to put that together isn't clear. One possibility would be to think in terms of a largish courtyard with a colonnade around it, which you go into through a elegant propylon. Then inside it, there would be a temple, probably with a colonnade around it, a peristyle, and then in front of it, a main altar and other altars scattered around. Um, but one could also try to arrange this material on a two courtyard basis. It's really not clear how to sort it out. The goddess presides over initiations. There are several references to parts of the sanctuary that uninitiated people aren't allowed to go into. At one point, they're allowed to go up to the entrance to a courtyard, but not further in. There's a section on the messy side, which is called initiatory right of the goddess. Initiatory right there. Telete. If anyone wants to be initiated, he is to serve the cult for three days. What that means, we don't know. And on the third day, he is to be shaved. I think it's certain that shaving there means shaving the head. That's what analogy in other cults suggests. I don't think it could be shaving the moustache or shaving the beard. When the text was first published, uh, it seemed to allow the possibility of initiates paying a fee instead of undergoing this shaving their heads. Um, I seized eagerly on that possibility for obvious reasons, but the revision has, alas, ruled that out. So no choice, you have to shave your head. Well, shaving the head as a condition of initiation is something completely unknown in Greece before this date, and indeed after this date too, in full Greek mysteries, such as the Eleusinian mysteries. Clearly men had to shave their heads. What about women? Um, well, women certainly could participate in the cult in some way, because there's a special section on the pollutions they had to be free from to come in, this includes some pollutions you don't normally get in straight Greek cults, incidentally. There are also cult officiants who are called phoibatriae, that means cleaners, and there's a priestess. There's no priest, but the goddess has a priestess. So there are women in the cult. It's not explicit that they could be initiated as well, but most initiatory cults were open to both sexes. It would have been inconvenient if there were sections of the sanctuary that the foibatriae, the cleaners, couldn't go into. Um, it's never explicit that women could be initiated, but I think the probability is they could. That was the norm in initiatory cults. They were normally open to both sexes. Did they then have to shave their heads as well? Horrible thought. Well, the text doesn't say. Um, in the cult of Isis, 
when men had to shave their heads, women had to wear headscarves. So let's hope it was something like that. Well, we're in the heart of rural Thessaly, but it must already be clear that this temple in the heart of rural Thessaly didn't host an ordinary Greek cult. And in the brief abstract, I've already mentioned the most remarkable proof of this. There are two festivals mentioned by name in the text, apart from the initiation. One is at the Alulaya or Elulaya. The first vowel is uh, written differently in two places, and the Nisanaya. Um, the first of these, the Alulaya or Elulaya, involved rites lasting a week in all. And these rites included people going round to collect money, a common thing in ancient cults, collecting money, going round to the threshing floors to collect money. That's the only real hint we have in the text of what was in fact the rural environment of this sanctuary, going to the threshing floors. And of course, the Elulaya also involved sacrifices and a procession. The Nisanaya also involved a procession, and it may have been equally elaborate, but it's probably vanished into one of those unclear places on the messy side we can't really read properly. What's key about both these festival names is that their names are extremely easy to recognize. They come respectively from the month names Elul and Nisan, which are found in what's called the standard Mesopotamian calendar, the calendar that operated in much of the ancient Near East. And of course, Nisan and I think Elul as well are still month names in Israel. It was pointed out very soon after the publication of the text that there's actually another bit of evidence for Alulaya in the Greek world. On Kos, there's a small private society, which according to its first editor, consisted of Anubiastai, worshippers of the Egyptian god Anubis. But what the stone actually speaks of, that's probably a stone of the first century BCE, is Aluliastai. Um, the first editor corrected Aluliastai to Anubiastai because at that time Aluliastai meant nothing, but the original reading of the stone is now vindicated. Quite a warning there about tampering with things you find written on a stone. Unfortunately, that stone doesn't teach us anything much more except that there were also worshippers of Alula, or whatever the name was, uh, celebrators of the of the Alulaya uh, on Kos. Well, we're also pointed eastwards very much by a line in the regulations for the Alulaya. On the 15th, the one who wishes and is willing is to sacrifice to Pan, whom the Syrians call Nairi, please, and to set on the table whatever he wishes except fish and pigeon. So one god in the sanctuary is Pan, whom the Syrians call Nairi, please. We're introduced here to a hitherto unknown and in some sense Syrian god, Nairi, please, who people thought was roughly equivalent to the Greek Pan. So this is an instance of the so-called interpretatio Graeca, identifying a foreign god with one of one's own. Your Naira, please, is our Pan. Another detail there is interesting. You can set on the table after this sacrifice, this is a, a table on which parts of the sacrificial victims were placed in front of the image of the god, whatever you wish except for fish and pigeon. Well, Syrian reverence for fish and for doves is already mentioned by Xenophon. If you asked a Greek about the cult 
of the so-called Syrian goddess, the first thing he'd say would be no fish eating. The Syrians think that if they eat fish, then they will swell up and die almost instantly. There are also several places in the inscription where the sacrifice of a pig is banned, and that too points us eastwards. So this seems to be a Syrian cult, but I use the adjective Syrian there in inverted commas because it's an extremely broad and vague term in ancient usage. It may well be that the unnamed goddess is indeed the so-called Syrian goddess, Dea Syria, about whom Lucian, or as some think, pseudo-Lucian, wrote a treatise after the manner of Herodotus. There's a dedication from Cranon in Thessaly of rather similar date, which is relevant here. Uh, it's made to the maiden from Bambuke. Uh, well, Bambuke was the center of the cult of the Syrian goddess as described um, by Lucian um, uh, out there in Syria, quite far east, we're getting towards the Euphrates by the time you get to Bambuke. Um, well, I don't think that the Syrian goddess was actually a maiden in the strict sense because uh, she had a consort, had dad, but even so, I think this dedication will probably be to the Syrian goddess. And it's very interesting because Clanone, again, like the site of uh, our sanctuary, is in inland Thessaly. So once again, something one wasn't really expected to turn up in that part of the world, but there it is. We think in Thessaly of Demetrias on the coast. That's a place where there's plenty of evidence for it being an international place. It's this presence of Syrian influences inland, in those scorched, on that scorched plain that's so unexpected. Well, the foreignness of the cult becomes even more obvious in a detail on the good side of the stele. Much of the good side is taken up with rules on what sacrifices you can bring and how to bring them. This section goes on for more than 50 lines. For anyone who's interested in ancient sacrifice, it's a kind of box of delights but also a Rubik cube of problems. Um, there's a lot here that's extremely strange in a Greek context, but the phrase that shrieks out is this one. Um, I'm not sure whether you can actually see the crucial words on this. Um, on my screen, they're hidden behind the uh, set of thumbnails of me and other members of the committee. But anyway, what it says is, if anyone wishes to sacrifice to the goddess according to the Hellenic custom, it's possible to sacrifice whatever one wishes except swine, and then details, cook the entrails, and then, and as sacred offerings on the fire, put such and such things on the fire. So we're in the heart of mainland Greece, but sacrificing Greek fashion, Hellenico nomo, is just one option among many that are offered to the worshiper. That really is the most extraordinary feature of the whole inscription. Well, what then is distinctive about uh, sacrificing Greek fashion? This is well controversial, but the answer seems to be that involves several of those bits that are described in such detail in Homeric descriptions of sacrifice that are so hard to translate. So essentially taking out some of the inner parts, the splankna, which are then roasted and distributed among the participants. That means a kind of inner circle, of the people who share in the splankna and also cutting out other portions that 
are going to be burnt on the altar for the gods. We seem to have these in the in the extract there on the screen. Um, we have cook the entrails, then some entrails are listed, and also as sacred offerings on the fire. So those two parts seem to be part of sacrificing in the Greek manner. Well, you can't really do all that, cutting out a large series of entrails and also burning other parts on the fire um, with small offerings. And most of the other offerings in this sacrificial section are small, a lot of them are birds. Um, so it seems that the typical offerings envisaged in a sacrifice in the Greek manner are animals of some size, sheep and cows, essentially, or sheep and oxen, essentially. So this is a thoroughly mixed cult. The dominant mode of sacrifice is actually assumed to be a non-Greek mode, but you can sacrifice in the Greek way if you want. The festivals have Semitic names, but there's also mention of a goddess, Artemis Fulake, Artemis Guardian, who has an area of her own somewhere in the sanctuary. Well, whether the whole idea of this initiatory cult comes from the East or is a Greek addition, a Greek adaptation of the cult that's come from the East isn't at all clear. There were, of course, initiatory cults in Greece. The Eleusinian Mysteries is the obvious example. I've not been able to find clear cases in the region of Syria um, of this kind of initiation. So uh, it may at that, it, the cult may at that level be some kind of hybrid. Well, the obvious question to ask is who are these people who introduced a largely Semitic cult to rural Thessaly? And alas, that's a question that can't for the moment be answered. A remarkable feature of this text that though about 150 legible lines survive, there's no single personal name in it. Pamela mentioned earlier my involvement in the lexicon of Greek personal names. And from that point of view, it's a peculiarly frustrating text. And I wonder if there's any other Greek inscription, 150 lines long, containing no single personal name. Well, related to that, uh, and a, another crucial question, is the question about the status of this cult. And that's a mystery as well. Normally, you look to the beginning of a text to find what body issued it, but there's no trace of that in what survives. It may have stood at the start of the messy side. That's one argument for thinking the messy side is the beginning of the whole text. Most people who've expressed a view on this matter think that the sanctuary belonged to a private society such uh, of some kind and of course we do know of such things in Greece. There's a very famous uh, inscription from Athens in the 330s where the merchants of Kittian on Cyprus ask the Athenian assembly for permission and they get permission to acquire land to build a sanctuary of their Aphrodite just as the Egyptians have already done for Isis. <coughs> And many nationality-based cults of this kind are known on Delos. So the Poseidonists from Beirut and others. And some of them had sanctuaries of a fair size. Um, of course, it's noticeable that this sanctuary um, in Thessaly is something quite considerable, though we can't measure it, but just from the references to bits of it in the text. On the other hand, we do know of many cases where cults which were privately introduced were then taken over by cities. And in fact, the spread of the cults of Isis and Serapis is one of the most striking religious phenomena of the Hellenistic period, those 
Egyptian cults, and there are many, many cases where they were taken up by cities, though beginning as private cults. On Athenian dominated Delos, the cults of both the Syrian goddess herself, again, and also of Serapis were brought in by non Greeks, but they were taken up by the Athenian controlling power. So it seems to me, though I have to say nobody believes me, but it seems to me far from impossible that that was the case here too. Though exactly why that was taken up, let's say, by Larissa, the sanctuary should be way out in the countryside. Uh, I don't have an answer to that. Well, regardless of that question, when this first text, uh, when this text first appeared, as I said, I was completely overwhelmed by it. Was I right to be so? We tend to think of Oriental cults, the so-called Oriental cults, as a feature of the Roman Empire, but that's not right. The Hellenistic period was a time of connectivity too. Cults were on the move then too, as I've just mentioned, in the case of the cults of Isis and Serapis, which spread in an extraordinary way in that period. Many compromises and adaptations must have happened between what was there in Greece already and what came in from outside. So perhaps with a little more imagination, I should have anticipated that something like this would one day be found. What's so unusual about it is we don't just know that there was a cult of a foreign god which had been taken up by a city, um, if that is what had happened, but the regulations are spelt out in this excruciating and marvelous and baffling detail. Well, as I mentioned, it's a very long text. There are lots of detailed problems in it I've not touched on at all, but that's the takeaway message. Gods were on the move, not just Greek gods moving outwards, eastwards to Afghanistan and even beyond in the wake of Alexander, but also gods from Egypt and the Levant are moving inwards and not just into islands and places close to the sea, but even into the least expected corners of Greece. I suppose if this had been found in the middle of Arcadia, that would be even more shocking. But that aside, I don't think there's anywhere one could put it uh, where it would have been less expected. Well, so much for that. I turn now to my second topic, questions put to the Oracle of Zeus at Dodona up in northwest Greece near Yarnina, Baron territory. Well, here I'm not exactly talking about a bombshell or at least not a recent bombshell. Uh, the bombshell was in fact dropped back in 1878 with the publication of Karapanos's Dodon et Seyprine. Apart from being the first study of the sanctuary at all, that book revealed that inquirers at the Oracle up there wrote down their questions on little lead tablets, which then apparently they chucked away, at least they're found all over the place at the site. Here are a couple. Uh, that one is complete and unusually easy to read. Um, easy to read, that is, if you're familiar with the archaic Corinthian alphabet in which a sigma is related, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is rotated 30, uh, 90 degrees to look like most of our, what most of us would think of as a mu. So that and that are sigmas. So it does take a bit of time to get used to reading this. Um, but given that every word is perfectly clear, every letter is perfectly clear, um, more typical, I'm afraid, of what most of these tablets are like is that one, uh, a nightmare to read. Also, the condition, a lot of them are like that. Even so, even Karapanos' early excavations revealed to us 
the wonderfully intimate and down-to-earth character of some of the questions that were put to Zeus at the donor. At the donor, incidentally, Zeus bears the epithet Naios, which we don't know what it means, and he's not paired with his proper wife Hera, he's in fact paired with the goddess Dione, whose name sounds rather like his own because the genitive of Zeus is Dios, Dios Dione. That's a very interesting fact. Um, and a lot of the questions are addressed to Zeus, Naios, and Dione. Well, three of my absolute favorites among uh, these tablets were already there among the ones that Carapanos discovered. Um, Aegis asks Zeus about the blankets and pillows. Did someone from outside steal them? Messanias asks Zeus, Naios, and Diona whether the child Anilla is pregnant with is his. Cleutas asks Zeus and Diona if it is beneficial and profitable for him to keep sheep. So, very down to earth questions and problems. Ever since uh, Calipanus's publication, well, no, but uh, there's like gap, but um, for many years in the 20th century, um, there was a further trickle of new tablets from three campaigns of excavation over 12 years by Evangelidis. Um, they include what's my absolute favorite, the Dodoneans. So here the whole community is asking a question of its local god. The Dodoneans ask Zeus and Dione, is it because of some mortal's pollution that Zeus is causing this storm? So it shows that Greeks really did fear miasma. Is it miasma that is causing this bad weather? Well, in 19, uh, sorry, in 2006, Eric Lott published a corpus of the 167 tablets of this kind that were known to that date. But the great number of strips that were found by Evangelidis in his three campaigns of excavation remained unpublished. Tragically, three designated editors died in succession, tragically young. It's not until 2013 that a corpus prepared by the last of those editors, Tassos Christidis, um, finally appeared, and that was, alas, posthumous. But when it appeared, it was worth waiting for. It contained no fewer than 4,216 items. That number, I have to admit, is greatly misleading. A lot of them are too fragmentary to be very clear or useful. Even so, the number that one can really do something with, one can work with properly, has increased greatly. There must be over 500 such now, as against Lothar's 167. Well, the new material hasn't turned the existing picture upside down, but it has filled it out and enriched it in many ways. If you go to my doctor's surgery, and I think it's the case also in many doctor's surgeries nowadays, you'll see a notice which says, at each consultation, you can only ask about one disease. And you'd think that oracles would need the same rule, but the new material has produced some splendid exceptions from the donor. Uh, ah, yes, there's the reference to the publication in 2013 by the three editors who all, none of whom lived to see it published, alas. Um, so here's one of these multi-purpose questions. God, good luck. Ibilitus asks Zeus, Naios, and Dione by doing what he would be successful and by sacrificing to what God and whether I should practice the trade which I was trained in or turn to another, and whether I will get it if he attempts it. These switches between first and third person are quite common on these texts, which are not sophisticated productions, and whether I should take Phenomena as wife or another woman, and whether indeed I should take a wife now or wait. So there are about five different questions all wrapped up in there. Uh, the one underneath is also the slightly less multi-purpose, but still rather complicated. Um, God, good luck. 
from Bukalos and Tonimnaste. By doing what? Uh, probably that means by sacrificing to whom would they have health and offspring and male offspring? I'm sorry about that, but questions about male offspring are common. There's no single one showing a couple wanting a girl um, and a son who would survive and guarantee of their property and enjoyment of what they have. So solve all my problems, please, Zeus Naios. I should say these multi-purpose questions are untypical and goodness knows how the oracle dealt with them. Most inquirers put a single question and in the majority of cases, it was put in a form requiring a yes, no answer. And that's extremely important for understanding the whole institution of oracular consultation. You don't go to God and say, what career should I pursue or who stole the silver, you say, should I keep sheep? Or was it an outsider who stole the silver? That's a question that evokes a yes or no answer. Well, among the new materials emerging, uh, sorry, among the new angles that emerged from the new materials, um, we get some questions from disadvantaged groups, slaves and women. The first one there is from a slave. Very touching, I have to say. Propitiating what good would it be better? And will I ever be free? I mentioned already that in the old material, there are a lot of questions about getting children. And I had to acknowledge that they were always about getting male children. Sometimes I'm afraid with a nasty implication about what the inquirer might do if he was told that he wasn't going to get a child from the wife I have now. It's sometimes put in that form, when I get a child from the wife I have now. Um, well, we now have a feminine counter. God, Clunica requests Zeus, Naios and Diona for a child to come to her from another man. And what God should she worship to get children? And then there's one silly fellow asking about buried treasure. Aeschytas asks, about treasure, whether there's any in the house, and by praying to what God he would find it. So it's a panorama of everyday hopes and fears. But what's particularly important is what the new material shows about how questions were answered at the Oracle, or at least I should stress about one way in which they were answered. If you look in the literary sources for the donor, you get all sorts of uh, accounts of what happened, all vague and hard to envisage, really. We're told that the rustling of Zeus's oak trees, uh, the leaves of his oak trees, gave an answer, or that doves uh, um, cooed and gave an answer, and things like that. There is, though, one concrete anecdote set in the fourth century um, which helps us. Uh, the situation is we're just approaching the crucial battle of Eutra, the battle that ended Spartan domination of the Peloponnese. The Spartans have sent an embassy to consult the oracle about the result. The urn containing the lots, that's the expression, the urn containing the lots is in place when a terrible thing happens, the pet monkey of the king of the Molossians, the local monarch, knocks it over. Dreadful omen. And the priestess tells the Spartans that this means they ought to be consulting about victory, but about safety, i.e. how are they to avoid total annihilation? Well, that vivid incident proves not just that the king of the Molossians had a pet monkey, which we didn't know otherwise, but also and more important, that drawing of lot could have some place in the oracular procedure at the donor. And there's a peculiar feature of the Greek vocabulary of divination that seems to relate to this. When an oracle is reported in a narrative text, the standard form is the God replied, or that's how we translate it, the God replied. But the verb that's, re that's translated replied in this context and in this context only doesn't mean that in any other context. 
What in fact means is, what in fact means is picked up. Well, what did the god pick up? Surely one of two beans or other tokens. And there is in fact an inscription at Delphi which speaks of beans. It's a regulation for the fees people from a particular city have to pay when they come to consult Delphi. And one clause runs, if anyone comes for the two beans, um, they have to pay such and such. Almost everyone has accepted that these two beans must have been used to draw lots. So in response to simple yes, no questions. A very elaborate variant of this is found in another fourth century text. This one comes from Athens. And the issue here is one of considerable political and economic importance. What's at issue is whether the land on the margins of the sacred orgas, uh, the sacred territory between Athens and Megara could be cultivated or not. Politically sensitive, that was what caused the first Peloponnesian, uh, the first Peloponnesian War uh, dispute over that land and economic implications as well. Well, the procedure used was extremely complicated. Can this land be cultivated or not? But in essence, two metal vessels were taken, one of them gold, one of them silver. The answer, yes, cultivate, was put in one of them. The answer, no, don't cultivate, was put in the other. And the Oracle of Delphi was then asked to choose between the answers in the two jars. But of course, the god didn't know which um, answer had been put in which jar. He was just told to choose, act either on the message from the gold water jug or the one from the silver water jug. So that was in effect the equivalent of simply tossing a coin on this economically and politically important issue. The new evidence is very important here. I had to digress a moment to introduce you to an oracular technique which was which is known from Hellenistic Egypt, both from Demotic and from Greek sources. Um, it persists into Coptic and it apparently goes back into earlier times in Egypt. What happened was that the consultant submitted two tablets or two strips of papyrus rather, um, which formulated the same proposition positively and negatively. If it is to my advantage to plow the bank of the lake this year, 33, and not to sow it, let this question be brought out for me. If it is not to my advantage to plow the bank of the lake this year, 33, let this question be brought out for me. So the, cult, the consultant submitted two strips of papyrus. Um, in this case, actually, these two strips had been written originally on the same strip of papyrus. We can see the join, actually. Uh, the two strips go in, then the god chooses one, and that one which comes out is the answer, and you know what to do. So the role of the oracle was simply to make a choice between these two uh, formulations of the question, the positive and the negative. Well. On my reading, several of the new question tablets from the donor imply this method. Uh, if for Apollonides, it will be better and more advantageous if he farms the plot, may this lot come out for me. So evidently there was another tablet which said, if for Apollonides, if for Apollonides it will not be better and more advantageous if he farms the plot, may this lot come out for me. If nobody among these people has stolen it, pick up this one. Um, uh, then uh, another one. If none, pick up this one. I think that's going to be an answer to the question, should I marry a named girl? We had a question where that man who asked all those questions asked whether he should marry Phenomena or not. But if I should marry nobody at the moment, pick up this one. Um, then another one about theft. Um, Parmenis, daughter of Eutiles, if she stole the eagle's silver, let him her pick up this one. 
who is the subject of picking up there isn't clear, probably the priestess or priest. And finally, one that's negatively formulated. Archonidas didn't enslave the child of Aristocles, nor did Archibius, son of Archonidas, nor did Sosandras, who then was the slave of Archonidas. Um, uh, uh, I can't actually read on my screen what happens to the right there, but it doesn't matter. Um, well, that's a negative formulation, but obviously there was a, a corresponding tablet in which Archonidas did enslave the child of Aristocles uh, and Archibios was involved in it as well and so on. Well, the vast majority of questions at the donor and that other oracles were binary in form, either this or that. So they could have been put and answered in this way and some it seems clearly were. Another very common form of question at the donor was um, what God should I sacrifice to? If I want to have a male child, what God should I sacrifice to? Well, there too, you can imagine the lot being used, though in a slightly different way. You can just imagine the jar with lots in having the names of a restricted range of gods and just one of them being picked out. Uh, that seems to me to make perfect sense. Well, I'm not claiming that all questions were posed and answered in this way. We do have some apparent answers of a different type. One that's fairly clear to me is this one. Um, put up with or cherish the one you have. Um, when this was first published, it wasn't understood. Uh, people took that esan there to mean defeat. Put up with your defeat. Come on, old boy, stiff up a lip. But subsequently, it was pointed out that esan in local dialect is in fact a present feminine participle accusative of the verb to be. So put up with the one who is, meaning according to the familiar Greek idiom, the one who is to you, the one you have, i.e. your wife. So that looks like one of these questions by some wretched man who's thinking about trading in his existing wife and going for a new one who might be more fertile. Uh, he's being told not to put up with, or let's be more gentlemanly, cherish the one you have. Well, um, that's not quite been put in the form of uh, the binary form of two tablets going in saying, uh, if I ought to divorce my wife, bring me the, send out this one. If I ought to stay with her, send me this one. It's just an instruction, put up with the one you have. Um, though the answer itself could certainly have been generated simply by lot, by spinning a coin. Um, there are also quite a lot of responses that are reported in literary sources that aren't in this form, but they are in verse, uh, as we find at Delphi. But uh, this isn't really a problem because we know that Delphi too, there was more, one, more than one oracular mechanism uh, operative. Um, we think of the Pythia raving away, but uh, we also saw earlier that text about coming for the two beans. So there's a lot oracle as an alternative there as well. A lot remains unclear, of course. One traditional puzzle has been to wonder how the oracle dealt with the extremely delicate questions that were sometimes put to it um, about theft, for instance, or even about poisoning. If I'm right about the use of the lot, the lot could even be used for questions of this type, because we saw earlier uh, a question, if Parmenis stole the silver, let someone pick up this one. So that's a question about theft, which is being dealt with ex hypothesis by this tossing a coin method. Well, the key here, I think, is that the consultant set the agenda, so to speak. The consultant doesn't say, who stole the silver, he or she has to name a suspect. If the lot then vindicates that suspect, the consultant could presumably try again with another. He'd go on down the list until eventually 
he or she got a yes. So not everything is clear, but we can actually hope that one day we will get even further. And I think we have got forwards um, in understanding this fascinating institution. Though, as I mentioned, over 4,000 tablets were published in 2013, there are many still to come if time and expertise and the political will can be found to work on them. Not all the tablets found by Evangelidis have ever been published. A colleague who knows the material estimates the total at 8,000. So there are three and a half thousand left. Watch this space and thank you very much for listening.